I am Shay Everett. I'm so happy to have all of y'all tuned in today and our wonderful guest, Dr. Larry Payne here. But first, I want to um, just introduce myself. I'm Shay Everett. I work for Dr. Sanborn at his nonprofit, Children at Risk. And um, while he is off vacationing in Copenhagen today and next week, I will be the guest host. Um, a couple quick notes. Your reaction papers to this week's lecture and TED Talk um, and reading are due on Sunday. Also, don't forget to upload your introduction video by Wednesday, August 31st. And if you have a specific partner in the class that you want to be paired with for your short paper or for your leadership videos, email me by September 1st. And don't forget to share your Twitter handle on our discussion board and tweet your questions live here. So with that done, Dr. Payne, welcome. Good afternoon, Shay. Great to be with you and to, <laughs> and to hello to the class out there. Awesome. We are so happy to have you here today. Well, this is always great fun to do. Dr. Bob and I have done this a few times before, and it's always great fun to sit uh, and be able to really talk about these issues that are so important to all of us. And they are important. And why don't we just start off by talking a little bit about your current work and background? Well, my current work really starts with trying to frame a contextual new social paradigm that gives us a lens to work from. Let me explain what we mean. Uh, I am working on this thing called an equity lens for looking at how we as Houstonians in 2016 develop a long-term view of a 20-year period which brings us to 2036 that is actually the 200th anniversary of the city of Houston. Our bicentennial will be in 2036. So I'm working on this piece that helps us look at shifting from the traditional to the transitional to the transformational by 2036 to really talk about what do we really want our city, our city to feel like, be like, act like, behave like toward other human beings, toward the other. And I think that's an important piece because if we don't make that shift, we're going to continue to do what we've been doing in social services and social practices without focusing on social justice and equity and doing systemic change, eradication, policy, change, legislation, and keep doing the same charitable social service thing. That's important, but not meant to be the only thing and only long-term way of looking at helping other human beings. So it's an important lens, I think, to apply and to talk about what a social paradigm really is in this context. So for our students who um, are just maybe starting <clears throat> off their degree program or just really thinking about nonprofits and social service, can you give us a brief explanation of equity versus equality? We hear all the time about equality, and equity isn't part of the conversation often, which is interesting. Well, and equity really is, when you examine and look at the issues and the problems and the concerns, you need to perhaps, given the social economic context of those issues and problems and concern, apply more time, talent, and resources to that end of town, to that issue, so that you can bring it out of where it is. Equality is we give everyone the same thing. You'll never raise an issue of equity to the level that it needs to be if you only apply the, the equality standard. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, and, and we use this example because it's in the nomenclature right now, of affordable housing. The, the federal government uses this term high opportunity, high, high opportunity neighborhoods. High opportunity neighborhoods. Well, I've been doing this work for 40, 45 years, and I've always learned when you say X, there's always a Y and a Z. So if you're saying there are high opportunity neighborhoods, what's the converse of that? There must be low opportunity neighborhoods, right? So what do you need to do to bring those neighborhoods up to the same level that these are? Again, remember, this is not an either or, but a both and conversation. Nothing against that part of the community or neighborhoods who've been able to be and become high opportunity neighborhoods because maybe they've had different advantages, different opportunities, then the, no, but we need to bring them up, the standards up over here, so that what? I, as a parent, get to send my child to the same school in their neighborhood, in their community, because now it is the same as this side of town, or if I choose to send my child to that side of town, I, as a parent, have a choice and option. An option. This is really rooted in, in the 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education that had two tenants even back then. And think about it for a moment. In, in the terms of 1954, 55 dollars, it was a lot easier to do, right? 
The doctrine had two, doctrine, two parts, separate but equal, freedom of choice. We bring every school up, wherever you find a school, this side of town, that side of town, this side of the railroad track, that side of the railroad track, they're now equal. Now I, as a parent, get to induct, in, induce the second part of the, of the doctrine, which says freedom of choice. I get to send my child to this school on this side of town or that school. On, we never did it. Mm -mm. We never did it then. And what we're seeing, we're paying some 55 years later the price and the cost of that. Right, so you have poor, bad schools typically in poor neighborhoods. Well, HISD is a great example. Yes. HISD depends on which zip code you live in, whether or not you will get not a good, but a great education. The new superintendent coming in, Richard Carenza, uh, from California, from San Francisco, is really right on the money. He is coming, and everything that he's been written, I mean, written about him, everything he's said since he's been here and before he's, he's come, he talks about looking at schools from an equity lens. He knows that that's his problem, that's his issue. And when he was the deputy superintendent in San Francisco before he came to superintendent, his title was, and I love his title, I looked around, the only person in the country that had that title, deputy superintendent for instructions, innovation, and social justice. Mm. Because he realized that even there in San Francisco was a question of equity. Right, even where you think that they're all doing well. Right, and he is really, but he is really focused on that. Mm -hmm. He knows that his mark that he's going to make here in Houston as superintendent to really change the district and the system is the question of equity. Well, good. It'll be very exciting to see. Hard conversation does. to have sometimes, too, though. Certainly. And it's hard to understand and to really wrap your mind around and see where we can take well, action sometimes. Well, because you know this. In the work we do at Children at Risk, and I say we because I'm just rolled off as a board member and I feel very strongly about the wonderful work Children at Risk does that Bob and the, and the great staff does. Equity has to also deal with our biases. You have to use the equity lens so that the biases embedded in our institutions are not reinforced in our solutions. So with children who are at poor performing schools, believing that they are capable and not really, in, which is hard to do, and it's hard for a lot of people, especially staff, teachers, principals at schools, um, to really believe their children are capable of great things. Or how we approach the solutions because of our biases, and the bias is not a negative, it's a positive because we all have them, mm -hmm. because I'm um, helping this poor downtrodden little child or this impoverished child or this socially economically deprived child. The labels that we put on are truly a detriment to trying to understand how to lift, here's the key, to lift the human being up out of poverty, because that's what we're talking about. We, we've made this such a, a kind of a negative almost like a, a, a coarse kind of way that we approach it, individuals and persons. When we elevate the individual and person to the level of human being and the status of being a human being, the way we then approach our solutions and, and answers are much different. Mm -hmm. Because you know this from the work we do at, at Children at Risk. You have to not only ask the question, you have to ask the question behind the question. Mm -hmm. You have to ask the unasked question, the question nobody really wants to talk about to get at the, at the real issues and problems. Because I think until we do that, and the Black Lives Matter movement is an interesting part of that. Why do we even have to use that phrase? I keep telling them there's a word that sits right at the corner of that last word, Black Lives Matter. Right at the end of matter is the word also. Because what you're saying when you say Black Lives Matter, you're saying Black Lives Matter also. And not more than you, not mm -hmm. more than anything else, but, but also. But just the fact that you have to say also mm -hmm. says therefore it does not, they do not matter. Right. And so it shouldn't be any one of those. It should be all human beings' lives matter. All human beings' lives matter. Now that I've put the individual and person to the status in which he or she deserves, forgetting all other labels, all other titles, as a human being, we're wired in a certain way that you cannot do and treat a human being the way you treat an individual and person. There's something inside of all of us that does not allow us to do that. And so I keep telling people we've got to talk about human beings. Because human beings are, are meant to be treated in a certain way. We don't do that. We want to use all these titles and, lab and labels. And guess what? You know this. We talk about it uh, uh, at Children at Risk and other nonprofits too because of our good friend Stephen Kleinberg at Rice University and, and his study, the uh, Houston Area Annual Survey. Demographically in Houston, you have to shift your whole paradigm. There are no such thing as a minority in Houston. Everybody's a minority. The only minorities truly are Anglo-Caucasian white people. Therefore, there are only no, 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 why I talk about minority as a majority, if you've got to talk about it, then, then the majority, the minorities are now the majority. That didn't really work. But I tell the majorities who's now, the, the minorities who are now majorities, there's a word I've got to put in front of you. You're the new unempowered majority. You're the new unempowered majority. Hmm. Because of education, because right. of other things. 
But even using those labels really don't, shouldn't be the, the, the wherewithal because you shouldn't have to. If you talk about labels, then you've got to be honest. HISD is working through the second era of resegregation of the district, right? All black and all brown schools, five minutes from here, take it all black and all brown schools. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily a negative, that's a reality. And why is that? It's reality because of housing and because of gentrification, because of lots of things. But I went to a little poor, let's see, we were in Orange, Texas, we were colored back then. I went to a little poor colored school. Because we were all one race and, and, and of poverty, I would put my little poor colored school education up against anybody's education. I got a great education. I mean, a tremendous education. I had caring teachers, I had a caring community, I had a community that undergirded and supported every student, not just the parents. We had adults who understood in local, in local, in local parentis, in place of a parent. We had all adults in embracing children. And I, and I say that all the time because that the ability for teachers to give unconditional love to all students is the piece that makes the biggest difference in the world. And so when I was at U of H at the College of Ed in the Institute for Urban, Urban Education, when I was training pre-service teachers, the number one thing I wanted you to un for them to understand, three things. Do you have the will and the wanting to be here? Are you comfortable in this neighborhood and this population? Second, can you give unconditional love to all students? All right? And third, have you mastered the one course you need to master, classroom management? Because if you don't master classroom management in the first 10 minutes you walk into that class, that classroom, and you lose it, you'll never get it back. Wow. And so all these things are just being said, just to honestly put on the table how we need to think. And I think it is a shift in our thinking. I think it's a new day. Uh, and we apply it to nonprofits as institutions. First, we have too many nonprofits. Yes, I said that. We've got to, we've got to come and look at combining and, and merging. We have to look at results and, what is, and solutions, not just services. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the advocacy piece is becoming more and more clear to everyone. Again, that is the either or, both and. You have to do the service and do the programming and the programmatic response, but you also have to do the advocacy to get the systemic change and policy. And I think that if we take a step back from our work as nonprofits and begin to really not only apply the equity lens, but to really say, what are we doing? What bang for the, what bang for the investment do we get? What return on investment? What, 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 what results are we getting? Mm -hmm. We serve the same people every year getting the same results. We keep people employed in, 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 nonprofits, in nonprofits, but what are we doing? And I think that's a hard question for many nonprofits to ask. And then if I apply the equity lens, does your staff represent the demographics of the community? Mm -hmm. <laughs> does your board represent the demographics of the community? And so if you start asking a series, and I, and I, have, a, I have a series of 25 questions. There's a series of 25 questions that if you start asking nonprofits and digging deep, and, and, dig, and pulling the layers of the, of the onion back. Most cannot hold up to that. So of your 25 questions, and this, which one do you think is the most um, important or the one where peop, uh, nonprofits you see are most lacking? Well, I think it revolves around this whole piece of <laughs> being honest with the mistakes you've made and learning from your mistakes. Mm. Uh, we all make mistakes in nonprofit work. Uh, but it's not fatal. It's only short term. And I think, and don't panic, because you've got to have the long term view, right? But uh, a mistake is just a way to take a step back and reassess what you're doing. And most of the time it revolves around two issues. You know this from people and money, personnel and money. Do you have the right people at the, working in, with and for your organization where it is both a fit and a match for the organization and the person, the employee. Both, a fit and a match for both sides. Number two, are you able, through proper funding strategies, both of fundraising and friend raising, to be able to raise the capital, not enough to just sustain and to, and to barely be there, mm -hmm. but to actually propagate your mission and go forward. If you're not able to raise the, the right funds and you're always having staff changes and turnovers, and you don't have people who are passionate to the mission and the purpose, then you need to maybe rethink what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And part of that, I think, is always the ability and the willingness to spend the money, raise the money as a board to hire a development officer. Not a good development officer, a great development officer. And that's tricky. Can you talk about 
um, some of the qualities that are really important for a development officer because they have a wide range of responsibility. Yeah, but here's, I think, the bottom line we all know. You basically got to steal a great person from a, another organization. Another organization. I mean, everybody does it. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, you, you get a great person who's come up to the ranks, who had two or three positions, who now the head development person. Uh, you pay them a decent salary, whatever it's going to take to get them to come. They'll raise the money for you. You set the bar with high expectations. You give them benchmarks to meet. You give them incentives to, to make. Maybe not all in salary up front. It may be in bonuses. It may be in whatever you got to do, the formula. But, but they know how the system works. And they know that you need them to do X, Y, and Z. And so I think the question we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to really, as a board, raise the funds? Everybody said raise the funds to, to make sure you can have the, the, your mission, so you can do your mission. First thing you got to do is raise funds to hire the development director, mm -hmm. all right? And if you can't do that, if you can't raise enough money to hire a development director now, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, which is shame on me, I'm assuming that you already have a great president and CEO in place, okay? Then the challenge is to raise the next batch of money to be able to sustain the hiring of the fund developer. Uh, if you can't do that, then you might as well close shop. Mm -hmm. Because if you keep, re keep having a revolving door around your fund developer, if you keep always having to raise money, raise money, basically sometimes just to pay their salary, they didn't even get to the, to the programs, then something's wrong with your model. And I think the business model, the business plan, needs to be re-looked at of how you write your job descriptions, how you do your funding, how you diversify your funding, how you have a transition plan in place, in place how you develop your partnerships, because there's really only four areas that matter in a nonprofit: relationships, branding, messaging, and communication. Hmm. You Th know, those are all incredibly important. They're, they're, that, that's that's really there. That's all there is. If those things are in place with the proper staff who have a passion for the mission, who are who are who are there because of the mission and a passion, not for the funds. Mm -hmm. It's not a job. <laughs> it's a career. You have your president and CEO in place. You have your fund developer. You will be successful. If not. You find, because this is where I come in with the consulting work I'm doing now, I come in as a, and do interventions. I come in and do triage. I come in, I do. Uh, you have frustrated staff, frustrated boards. You have tension. You have stress. You have everything going wrong, but yet we're still trying to cobble together enough just to, co to exist and to stay in business. It's not, it's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with a business. When I, whenever I work with, with, businesses, non, with small businesses and entrepreneurs, the number one thing you have to do going into it, you cannot be undercapitalized from the beginning because you will never catch up. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. And you will be frustrated and you don't even have enough money and you didn't plan ahead to have enough money in the bank to have at least be able to survive six years, I mean six months a year until you build your customer base. You didn't remember and think about the number one rule of entrepreneur and small business. You, as the president and CEO, as the, you don't get paid for the first year. 99% <laughs> of them do not get paid for the first year. All right? Because all those things are important, and there are lessons learned from a lot of people who've done this, but you've got to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. And I think we get caught up so much in wanting to deliver the service, to do the good, we forget that, no, this has got to be right. If not, you kind of limp along. And I see so many nonprofits just kind of limping along day to day. So if you have a good CEO in place, if you have a good chief development officer in place, you did mention um, finding good match of staff members, mm -hmm. making sure this is a good match for them long term right. and also a good match for the organization long term. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I believe in nonprofit work as a mission, a calling, and a career. If anybody's there for the job and a salary, they're in the wrong business. Uh, because you're not going to get rich. You should be paid adequately. You should be paid fairly and justly. You should be paid uh, as much as the organization can afford to do and still meet their mission and service. But you've got to have the right people. Um, and I think many times we have what I call pass-through people who uh, want to do it for a year or two, put it on their resume, and hopefully use it to jump to something else. Um, I think that I see so many young people now in nonprofits who are committed, who are sincere, who are dedicated. They want to become the CEO of a, of a nonprofit. They really want to get there. And they, and, they, and they have, unfortunately, in some organizations, blockage. I call them people who needed to go, need retirement, <laughs> should have retired and resigned years ago. You know? uh, and they've done great work. 
you've done great work, you've served well, get your kudos, get your pat on the back, and leave. So is that part of being a good leader, is knowing when to leave and move on? Definitely knowing when to leave and move on. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in, in, in getting things started, getting the foundation secure, getting the sustainability plan in place, and then move on to the next one. Mm. Because I think that you always have, I've found, and this is true, today is really true, you always have brighter, smarter, younger people behind you. And so you pass on what, whatever wisdom and knowledge you think you have, you pass on to them, you learn from them, they learn from you, and you get out of their way. Because what they're able to do with this that we weren't able to do back then because we didn't have the technology or the ability to, to use technology in a very creative way is amazing to me. Uh, what you can do now with technology and a small staff that took you a larger staff in years past is amazing. Very true. And I think that you need those people who are creative and innovative and know how to use technology to the maximum to achieve your mission and to reach as many people as you can reach to get them excited about your mission. Because at the end of the day, one thing is true, the, the truism about nonprofits that never change, no money, no mission. I don't care how great your mission is, no money, no mission. Mm -hmm. And so you have to reach a larger number of people today because you have so many, not only nonprofits, but so many other interests in people's lives because of technology, pulling them, literally pulling them in different ways and directions. You know, it used to be you get your message out on TV, you were good to go. You know, if you could run a commercial or a PSA and go, et cetera, or get on the radio, you were good to go. Now, if you can't be on this, it doesn't matter. So that relates to a video that a lot of our students are watching this week. It's a TED Talk, and the subject really is, how do you get people to buy what you're selling? How, how do you inspire people to really invest in your organization? So what would your answer be to that? I think the old-fashioned way, <laughs> uh, relationships. People who I know give, who give money to nonprofits, to causes, to issues, to charities, they do it because of the other human being on the other end who's doing the asking. They do it because of a long-term relationship built on mutual trust and respect over many years. They do it because they trust, trust is the key word, they do it because they trust the person doing the asking of them to contribute their time, talent, or treasure. They do it because they trust the person. And that relationship is one that is really built over time. You don't build a relationship with this. You don't build a relationship with these. You don't maintain a relationship with these. These are only tools that help you to further nurture the relationship that you've invested time with in developing one-on-one -on -one with another human being, face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball. There's no substitute, and I always tell every, everybody involved in anything, <laughs> and excuse me, I use it this way because this is my background, so I'll add some to it. God, or God, Allah, Yahweh, Buddha, gave us breakfast and lunch and dinner for a reason. Not only do we have to eat to maintain and, and for substance of our body, it's an opportunity to break bread with another human being. And so never eat alone. You've heard that. Never eat alone. Never have a meal. Never, never have a meal alone. Never eat at your desk. <laughs> really. Never, you know, don't even eat with your coworkers, but once or twice a week if necessary. You've got to develop relationships uh, with human beings. Those relationships I'm talking about are only built on face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball. I want to see the facial expressions. I want to see and hear the tonality in your voice change. I want to see your anguish about you sharing a story of your life with me. Because all of, all of life is is a, a series of stir, stories along the journey. I want to know your story. And that's a really good point, especially for our students who are really looking to get into the nonprofit sector. Networking is huge, and that is just relationship building. So and I never use the word networking. <laughs> networking is, to me, somebody came up with that. I don't know who and where. Networking is like tolerance. Uh, those two words, to me, are, are like, like touching the third rail of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, the transit system. Because I think we've overdone it. I think mm -hmm. we've overused it. I think we've overpreached it. All networking is, as you said, is relationships. So don't talk to me about networking. Just go develop a relationship with another human being. So all right. That is great, and that's something that I've gotten advice for all the time. Go have coffee with this person. Go have lunch. What, whatever it is, because that you know what that. you're looking for in that relationship is 
when opportunity comes to have someone use your name, present your name, share your name or experience or background or resume with another human being that they have a relationship with, they will do it. All right. And so how do most people still in this society find a job based upon connecting with other human beings through relationships? And I think that we, we've downplayed the issue of relationships because Facebook has mirrored the words of relationships and friendships. You know, there's a difference between a relationship and friendship. Friendship is a byproduct of a properly developed relationship. I, will, I love all my friends, I welcome my friends, but friendship is not my goal. The highest attainable goal in a friendship is to be loved and liked. The highest attainable thing in a relationship is to be trusted and respected. Mm. All right? Because if I'm trusted and respected, I can hold you accountable. We can talk about the hard issues. We can agree to disagree. We can, you know, we can, we, can, uh, we can argue, fight, discuss over an issue all day. And then when it comes time for happy hour or dinner, we stop there. We go and we break bread. We may come back the next morning and pick up where we left off. Because you've got to be able to have that, that distance with people about the issues and the person. And I think this is where nonprofits sometimes, and, and most people get things confused, get things twisted. You have to always separate the, per the issue from the person. You can't make and take this stuff personal. It is never about the person, it's always about the issue. And here's the phrase I use. Aggressive to the issue as, ne as necessary, aggressive to the issue as necessary, but always reconciliatory to the person involved in the issue. It is never about the person, it's always the issue. And you've got to keep those separated. So I can argue, I can disagree, I can get passionate, I can have great intentionality and mindfulness, I can really get spirited about my dialogue, I can disagree with my Republican and Democratic friends, my social justice friends, my non-social justice friends, but at the end of the day, it's just around the issues, it's not personal. We can have a great relationship built on, built on mutual trust and respect and agree to disagree politely and still have a partnership around the issue that we both share in common, that we both feel passionate about. And I think that shared common vision is important. We have to get to that point of that shared common vision, take all of this passion we have, and work together. Whether we are from the same side of the aisle, too much divide right now anyway, right? Right. Divide between the I and me and the we and us people, divide between the either or or the both and people. You know, and I think we've got to figure out a way to bridge that gap. And I think the bridging of it is through relationships. And I'll just end that little piece right quick. If I have relationships built on mutual trust and respect, I can get to the second part, which is what? Commitment and accountability to and for each other. Commitment and accountability to, it's a two-way street. When you commit to me, I commit to you. I get to hold you accountable to the commitment, you get to hold me accountable to the commitment, all right? If I have the proper relationship built in mutual trust and respect, when I hold you accountable to the commitment, it's not personal. So don't get mad at me, don't get upset with me, and if you have the right relationship, people don't. It's the only people who are worried about being loved and liked all right, that when you call them on commitment and accountability, they get all offended. I want to talk about the third piece, because if I don't do the first two right, I never get to the third one, which is what? Action and behaviors. In the end of the day, the only thing I can measure is your actions and behaviors, right? Don't tell me you love me, just show me. In fact, use words of on, only if necessary. And so it really is that whole, you put, draw a triangle, draw a triangle, make a triangle, Draw, make a triangle, put the human being in the middle. At the top of the triangle is the issue of relationships, mutual trust and respect. To the right of the triangle is commitment and accountability. To the left is action and behaviors. Because I, I see this so often, we are good at commitment, we're horrible as account with accountability. Human beings love to commit because they know most of the time nobody's gonna hold them accountable. <laughs> Commitment's easy, accountability is the hard part. In, in, in social services and in nonprofits, I see that all the time. And the classic example I use is a meeting. And I use the, the, the steps of the church, again, when I say church, church, parish, temple, synagogue, and mosque, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, worship, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. You commit to me on the steps of the church on Sunday after services that you're going to be at the meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday night. Okay? I call you on Monday to remind you of the commitment. You commit again that you're going to be there, right? So now I think she, she's definitely going to be there Wednesday night, 7.30. Wednesday night, 7.30 comes. Half the people or none the half who committed are not there. We reminded them Monday, they said they're going to be there. 7.45 shows up, maybe a few people now are there, we can have the meeting. Now here's what I do, and I recommend this to everybody because you only have to do it one time. I've been doing this for 35 years. I get their home number and their cell number. Now mostly a cell because a lot of people don't even have home numbers. A lot of, and I, I'm an early morning person, I'm a late night person. I go find me a Starbucks or something that's open 24 hours and I sit and read after the meeting. 
I'll talk about them after the meeting in a moment, but I go sit and read, bring my work, wait till it's about 1 o'clock, sometimes 2 o'clock, and I call them up. And I hope I wake them up. And I hope they get mad. And I hope they cuss me out and call me every name but a child of God. But the beauty is, you see, I don't care. I don't get upset. It's not personal. The commitment you made was not to me. The commitment was to us, to the organization, to the group. All right? The commitment has nothing to do with I and me. It's about we and us. And I, wouldn't, I am not going to be derelict in my duty by not holding you accountable to the commitment. See, it's a two-way street, right? And I'm not going to be derelict in my duty by not holding you accountable. One or two things will happen. If they're serious about commitment going forward with you, you can look at, at that door at 730, usually about 725, they're going to walk through that door. If they're not serious about commitment and accountability, they'll never commit to you again. Now, people always say, well, Larry, that's awful harsh. You lose people that way. You can't lose something you never had. What you do do is you gain people who now see that you and the organization are serious. You now, they now see and understand that commitment and accountability is paramount. They now see the organization as credible with integrity of ethics and values that want to move the agenda forward. That's not playing game or wasting people's time. Because by you not coming to that meeting, you had a piece of the puzzle, information, facts, and data that we needed to move our agenda forward. We couldn't have the work that we needed to do because you didn't bring your part. You wasted everybody else's time who were committed and came, right? And because we have this problem with relationships and friendships, because, see, what I, when I made that phone call, I, just, I don't care. It's so freeing not to take it personal, not to get upset. You can yell and scream. I always, when you're through yelling and screaming, now, where were you? It's always my response. So where were you? You said you didn't have the courtesy to call, email, or text, say you weren't going to be there. Things happen, life happens, emergency happens, we know that. But you said Monday night you were going to be there when I called and remind you. So we got to take, start taking this stuff serious of commitment and accountability because if we work in the realm of relationships, I mean friendships rather than relationships, worried about being loved and liked, you'll never say and do the hard things you've always worried about somebody loving and liking you. Relationships says, on the other hand, why this phenomenon occurs, the meeting after the meeting in the parking lot. The meeting after the meeting in the parking lot of most organizations that I know, the meeting after meeting in the parking lot that sometimes lasts longer than a meeting inside because now everybody's saying what they wanted to say should have said in a meeting. They didn't want to hurt or offend anybody's feelings. They didn't want to fall out of love and like with, with the group. So they don't do it there. They do it, and you've seen it. Everybody's seen it. I've, I've even had people who call back and report to me, like, you know, you said that and it happened. Two or three little groups in the parking lot standing around after the meeting talking about the people in the meeting, talking about what was said and done, tearing down about what they agreed to, that's not the place to do it. That is so detrimental to an organization, to an institution, particularly nonprofits. And it happens so often with nonprofits. I know people who report back to me that the meeting after the meeting in the parking lot lasts longer than the meeting inside. Because now everybody's saying what they should have said, what they wanted to say at the meeting, but didn't want to offend. If you've got the proper relationships of mutual trust and respect, it's not about offending. It's about putting on the table at the time and place what needs to be said and discussed. We do detriment to ourselves, to our organizations, by not taking the proper time to develop a relationship with another human being. And therefore, we never, we never get past some of this impasse. We waste a lot of people's time. That's why a lot of people don't want to be bothered with us. Hmm. Nonprofits waste a lot of people's time. And so we've got to figure out a way to get, get past that. Well... I like that you brought that up. First, I really like that whole, your, the whole how to mutual trust and respect, your triangle. Um, I think it's actually very pertinent, even from my perspective in different places that I've worked. Really, it's uncomfortable to hold people accountable. It's uncomfortable to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's not personal. Nope. And if you don't view it as personal, it doesn't have to be The issue and the person has to always be separated. Mm-hmm. So let's um, start looking at some of our questions. Oh, okay. Um, Jen Liu Cook asked if you think an effective leader must be one that is familiar with both the for-profit and non-profit sectors, which kind of leads into or tags along to what you were saying about um, wasting people's time. Yeah. <laughs> Businesses don't tend to waste people's time, but nonprofits do. And so if you have some kind of um, a knowledge of them both or experience with them both, do you think that that helps? improve a nonprofit's performance? I think you need to borrow the best from both disciplines. I think they both have things to add. Um, I think we, we got to, again, 
the, the, the human being of how you treat the human being, uh, nonprofits are really much better at that than corporations. Uh, but corporations also can help us understand how to do it in a way that we allow people to grow in development. I think the issue is, is more about always about staff development and human development. I think if you're giving your employees, whether it's in the corporate or the nonprofit sector, the ability to grow by having enough staff development, enough continuous education, enough opportunity to help them look at their pluses and their minuses. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing all of these, uh, these Myers-Briggs and 360s and all that stuff. They're in the Berkman, there are so many tools out there now that help you look at and understand the human being. The more I, I understand how the human being ticks, how they work, how they react, how they lack, what's their likes and dislikes. I think the little one that does the color schemes that you, after you do the test, mm -hmm. everybody has a color code. I think that's a marvelous thing because I've used this in, in, with organization. When you do the little color code and you put it on your, on your door frame, before I even walk into sitting down with that person for a one-on-one -on -one meeting, I know exactly how to approach them based upon their likes and dislikes, what they prefer. To pref it's really just their preferred way of behaving, of being, of acting. And if I know that, then I can give a, just a quick little pivot on how I'm going to present or talk about what I'm going to talk about. It always comes across much better with acceptance from the person. You're exactly right. But it's all those things. It's not a right or wrong. It's just that we all are different in our preferences about how we want to be approached, how we want to be dealt with, how we want to be handled. And so I think it's a, it's a question of the social, economic, and political part of our lives in our personal, professional, and public life. But here's what I think it's more of. And this is back to the corporate versus nonprofit. I think the, the intentionality and mindfulness of dealing with human beings, I try to always use the word human beings, not individuals and persons. Because we've got to take into consideration what? The head, the heart, and the gut, right? How we think, how we feel, how we act and behave. That's a process. That's an internalization. But here's what it really is. It's alignment. The question I always ask when I go into work with an organization, the first question I ask, and I do it in focus groups, and I usually do it away off-site with no managers or supervisors in the room. Let's talk about alignment in this organization. And this is what I mean by alignment. In my cognitive, my affective, and my behavioral parts of my being, am I in alignment? Do I stop and think and reflect and meditate about what I say I think and believe? So I'll know how I feel about what I say I think and believe. So therefore, I'll be able to talk about my actions and behaviors being consistently aligned with how I say I think and believe and how I feel. I can always tell when a person is out of alignment because they will talk one way and act a completely different way. And I think, again, if you have relationships with people, you call them on that in a loving, gentle way, right? In the way they need to be presented, knowing maybe their color schemes or whatever other uh, uh, tool you use. People appreciate someone pointing out to them that they're out of alignment, but only if you're in a relationship with that person. Because it goes, it goes like this, if I'll just do the little schematic, because it really works to get you to think about it. The head, the heart, and the gut, the think, the feel, the act, the cognitive, the affect, the behavioral parts of my being. The past, the present, the future, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, the message, the mission, the motivation, the traditional, the transitional. The tra I can go like this all day. Because that's all it is. What do I, as a human being, when I stop and get silent and get still, reflect and meditate, and think about what I really, what I really believe for myself, not what others want me to think, not what media wants me to think, not what these machines want me to think. What do I, as a human being, think? Once I've done that first step, now what do I feel? What emotions and passions arises in me based upon what I say I truly think and believe? And based upon what I say I think and feel, what action behaviors am I called to now to perform? We both know action behaviors takes on two forms, letting go of negative action behaviors and taking on positive action behaviors. But that process in this busy world we're all in, you've got to find time to meditate and reflect. I call it meditation reflection. I call it metaflect. You've got to find time to meditation, to do meditation reflect, to get still, to get quiet, to hear that voice that we all have inside of us as human beings speak to us. And I think we get so caught up sometimes in the passion of the mission and the, and the, and the work we do, we don't take time for that. You call it work balance, call it family balance. 
Not only is it family and work balance, it's your individual balance. When do you find time just for you? That's the most sacred time we can carve out these days. Just that selfish little time for me. Because mm -hmm. here's what I tell people about selfishness. We're all called to be servant leaders. We're put on the face of the earth for one reason, one reason only, to be a servant leader. To do that, I have to take care of myself first so I can be ready, available to serve other human beings. I get to be selfish only in that regard so I can be selfless in my service to others. But if you don't take time to do that for self, you'll never have anything to give. You'll never have the energy to be creative and innovative in service to the human beings that you say you're working so hard for every day. And that is a fantastic point and something that I have a master's in social work and that's something we learned is not selfish, but it's self-care. Yeah. It's like in an airplane, you have to, you have to put, put on, on your, your own mask, mask first. That's before right. helping someone else. And it connects with a question from a student, Emily Schreiber, who says, if you care deeply about the mission of your organization, how do you learn to not get personal about the issue? And I would say, from the social work perspective, right. is that it's really knowing yourself, knowing your biases, knowing your beliefs, mm -hmm. and the way that you view the world, so that you can really clearly accept the views of others. Very good point. And it really has, we, all have to, we all have to spend time on our lenses. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's an equity lens, a bias lens, uh, our, our daily, here's what I always say, our daily lived experiential realities. It's an important point. Our daily lived experiential realities are different. Just different. Not better than, not more than, not, not right, less not than, wrong. Not right, just different. Human beings have a hard problem at leaving it at that because mine has to be better or more or more important or more real or more whatever than yours. No, they're just different. There's a phrase that's been around for years and I'm trying to get Different is different, amen, period. <laughs> if we could just leave it at that, right? Not better than, not more than, not less than, not wrong or right, just different. So if I can approach the other human being knowing that their opinion, perspective, and viewpoint may be vastly different from mine because we are all different as human beings. My experiences are different. You never lived in my shoes. I haven't lived in your shoes. I grew up in Orange, Texas with the Ku Klux Klan, really literally grew up with the Ku Klux Klan. Obviously that shape, that lens shaped me around certain issues. Right? So we have to really allow the other human being to be fully human. Humanity says clearly that I get a group of human beings who are different to come together around a shared common vision for the sake of serving the rest of humanity. Doesn't mean that we're going to agree or see eye to eye. It does mean those things that we can agree on, the we agree statements that we can turn into a common shared vision and collectively worked on, work on, that's what we have to do. We may leave 90% of the stuff over here, but that 10% that we do agree on, let's go. Let's go get it done right now. And I, I think even in, in nonprofits, we forget the, the four T. We always talk about time, talent, and treasure. The four T is touch. The touch piece, again, goes back to the relationship piece. And we know this, we all know this, but nothing happens without trust. Nothing happens without trust. And so if I don't develop that and have that as the backbone going into whatever it may be, we're never going to be we're never as successful. It's been proven. We are never successful. And I don't, I don't mean which is what we accept as half successful. Or that's where we are now. Or three-fourths successful. I mean true success. And true success takes time with human beings to get there. We don't want to spend the time. Right. That's great. We're in a hurry-up world. And the hurry-up world is taking its toll. That is so personal, true. Personal, professional, and public lives. We all have three. I think it's taking its toll in all three spheres of our life. Our personal, professional, and public lives. Um, let's take one more question from the students. Okay. Um, Andrea Kirkpatrick. She asks, what types of backgrounds should you look for when recruiting board members? <laughs> and you have been a board member of <coughs> different organizations. Oh, Lordy. So. Miss Andrew, you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> I've been a board member of many, many organizations. I've also been the president and CEO of from now one, two, three, four nonprofits. So I see it from both, both sides, from the CEO's role and from the board members. I think board members today I think the number one quality for a board member is the ability to, to sit and listen and learn and hear. 
and shut up and stay silent until you really learn the organization, until you really have a feel for the mission, the calling, the purpose of the organization, until you spend some time with other board members who have been there before you, one-on-one, -on -one, relationships, the meals, the coffee, the tea, until you've talked to uh, staff members, until you and the CEO and the president have had time to really sit together. And then once you've done all of that, really take a step back and ask yourself the question, what kind and type of board member do I, two parts, want to be and need to be for the sake of this organization? But I think, you know, most great board members that I've had and I've seen, that I've worked with, that I've been a part of, Sometimes everybody kind of looks at them funny. For the first three, four, sometimes even five meetings, they don't say a word. You know, even and if you throw a board retreat in there, they'll go to the whole board retreat sometime and not say a word. Maybe ask one question. Because they're listening, they're learning, they're taking notes. They're going to follow up when they leave there. And I think that an informed, an informed listening, hearing, and caring board member will eventually be the type of board member, whether they're going to raise a lot of money or not, that's not the issue, that are going to contribute their wisdom, their time, and bring something to the table that's going to be substantial to move the agenda and the, of the organization forward. And I think that that's the number one quality is to be still. I always tell people, be still first. Which is very hard to do in it this world. It is very hard to do in this world. You feel there's a lot of pressure from a lot of sides to perform, to produce. And I tell to board act. members, uh, tell us you need to uh, tell us up, up front that you're going to do this. I suggest that they do this, but tell us up front so nobody's wondering, well, what's the matter with them? Why are they mad or they upset? They were ready to hack them off. No, I'm just listening and learning. Or it would be great if that was the culture of your onboarding process and your board members. Well, now you've so gone. See, you didn't go. What's to say? You didn't go from preaching to meddling now. <laughs> uh, that, that should be part of the onboarding process. But that's hard too, because if we bring board members in in the need of a crisis or semi-crisis to raise money quickly or to do or to pull off of their network, then we don't really want them to sit there. So right. I think it's really, uh, again, not either or, it's a both and. How do we, we wed both the needs of the organization and the need of the, of the board member to be effective and to be productive for the long haul? Because here's what I tell folk about board members. Long haul is what you want. You want folk at the end of the day who've made a contribution, who before you ask them when their term is about to expire, are uh, they going to re-up? They, they, they already told you, don't even think about taking me off this board. <laughs> you know, particularly if you have terms that allow to, to continue. That's what you want. I mean, that's what I, the great uh, nonprofits in the city I've seen, you know, it's, yeah, everybody has to roll off at some point for a year because most bylaws allow that. But you want that continuity of those people who have been there. I want that one third. I want the one third of the group in the middle and I want that one third of the new ones. All right? So I get that great mix of wisdom and perspective and opinion. I want a board member who's been there through the hard times and the good times, when we almost failed, when we almost died, when we almost went out of business, and now it's over here. All right? I think you need all of that perspective to be able to have that long-term view. Because the other piece that we haven't touched on that goes into the board members and the longevity and the clarity of a board member's role, both short-term, mid-term, and long-term, is the question of succession planning. Mm -hmm. Boards have to get much better at developing succession plans and even lovingly pushing out a great CEO at some point if they have not at some point in time deemed by the board and executive committee to put in place that second in command, whatever title you want to give them, that you groom for the sake of the organization having that succession, built in succession. I think that's, that's, the, that's a weakness that most nonprofits fall, fall down in. We have people literally dying in the job. Right. You know, never was intended to be that way, nor should it be that way. So I think all of these things are important, but we really got to do it, those two words that always come to mind, intentionality and mindfulness. We have to do all of this with intentionality and mindfulness. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen at osmosis in the, in the sky. You have to really focus on making it happen. And I think we're, we're really, we're hesitant because if you love the person and are doing a great job, not, you're not meant to be there forever. Nobody is. Uh, and not, nor should anybody want to. I mean, I, I know lots of friends now who are heading nonprofits. I'm urging them to retire. You got, a, you got another life. You got about 10 years to go f 
fish and hunt while you got your help. You've, you've laid your foundation. You've laid your predicate. You've, you've made this organization great, you know, and you've kind of laid the foundation for this next 20 years of greatness. Go do something else with your life. You know, you've got kids and grandkids who would love to spend more time with you. I think we get, we get caught up in our own passion about our own mission that we've helped create and many times don't know when to go. And I, I think it's, it's clear that we, we don't like to talk about succession planning. Oh, it's a hard, death is a hard topic, so much less succession planning, for sure. You know, like you said, it's not death, and not where everybody's dying, but, you know, we just... It's so that that doesn't have to be. Doesn't have to be, and, uh, you know, I always believe you go out on top, and you get your flowers while you're alive, you get your kudos and your, you know, your recognition while you're alive, uh, and do that, because everybody deserves at some point to say, good, well done, good and faithful servant, while you're alive. Right. Not those words said over you after you're after you're dead. So, anyway. Very true. Well, we have just about 10 minutes left. Oh my goodness, Maybe a time goes less. by so quickly. It really does. So is there anything that you'd like to touch on? I mean, we were talking about some really great stuff around the future of Houston and leadership and nonprofits. Yes. Uh, thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. And that's the 2036 piece. Uh, 2036, a short, mere 19 years away from now, will be the 200th anniversary of the city of Houston. We'll celebrate our bicentennial. So I've been asking everyone, what's your number one hope and dream and vision for Houston in 2036? But here's the most important part of that question, which is the second part of the question. And how would you be acting and behaving now if you really wanted that to happen? We don't think long-term in nonprofit. We don't think long-term in city government, quite frankly. Mm -mm. Uh, corporations, back to the succession planning thing, they do it. Most major corporations that right around here from where we are at U of H downtown, they can tell you who the next two or three CEOs are going to be. They're already giving them the right assignments, giving them the right skill set, making sure they, if it's an international company, that they get time abroad, uh, working for the company in different environments. They, they plan, they groom, they organize, they, they develop, they do all those things they need to do. We don't do that. But I think we're going to have to be forced to do that. I think the change in demographics of our community is forcing the issue of, of equity because of great poverty that we have in this city. I think the, the 2036 paradigm shift, social paradigm, basically has five components that I think are important. They ended up being all five E's, but that's just the way life works. <laughs> Ethics, equity, economics, education, and employment. Ethics, equity, economics, education, and employment. And what's a social paradigm? What's a shift? Social paradigm is just simply, we all know it, we study in school, excuse me, is based fundamentally on values, expectations, and obligations. It centers around who has the obligation to do what in our society. And I think it's the classic definition of democracy and citizenship. And I think nonprofits in a civic engagement or a civic environment in which we work don't focus enough sometimes on the citizenship aspect of working and living together in a democracy in a pluralistic society that has those five tenets, which are what? We'd love to talk about two of those five. We'll talk about those two all day. What are my individual rights and privileges that go with being a citizen in a democracy? We love that. Why? It's all about me, right? <laughs> no, I may act like it's, all, it's about you, but in the day, it's all about me. That's the I and me discussion. What about the other three of the five, which are what? Our common duties, obligations, and responsibilities. To whom? The other. To find the other increasingly in our society, someone different than me, someone who does not look like me. But the hallmark of we the people, I never read I the people anywhere, <laughs> the hallmark of we the people have always been our common duties, obligations, and responsibilities to each other. And that's where the rub comes. Because people define that differently. People define how that is supposed to be exercised differently. Nonprofits, particularly those working around social issues, that's where they are, right? We don't, it's not about our individual rights and privileges. It's about our common duties, obligations, and responsibilities to each other. And so how we begin to lay that out going forward, particularly again with the demographic shift of the majority, of the minority now being the majority, of the new and empowered majority, of the resegregation of our schools, of the new superintendent coming in for HISD's number one issue, equity, how we begin to talk about all that stuff, how even children at risk begin to address their work under this new lens, this new paradigm shift, this new equity model, becomes a whole different ballgame. Because I think it really is going to force us 
if we're going to get it right, to have a bright future for all of us. Because here's the past informs the present so we have a greater future together. You know, and I think it's taking the long view of history rather than a short view. It in, and, for, for, and for communities of color, this long view of history becomes very important because it's not only about our heroes and sheroes, the past, it's not only about the walking, talking now generations, it's about the other three that we never really talk about. It's about those yet waiting to be born. It's about the immigrants who will come to our city. It's about the newcomers who will come to our city. It's, project, it's projected between now and 2035 that we'll have about 9,000 more people in Houston, just Houston. It's projected we'll have 3.5 million in the eight county region, all right? That's a lot of new human beings, all right? And so we don't do a good job of taking care of the ones we have now. What are we gonna do under that scenario? You know, and I think it's just a series of questions that need to be asked because if we don't ask those questions, we end up kind of in that same place where we were before, and this is the one that always got me. If you say that the region is going to have, depending on which data and statistics you use, between 3.3 million and 3.5 million, a million of that roughly is going to be in Houston. And then you talk about the need in 2017 for 72,000 middle skill jobs, which we don't have the people prepared for to take now. What's the future of Houston? We talk about this stuff, but we don't lay it out to say, oh, well, we've got to start acting and behaving in a different way if we expect a different outcome. And I think that really it talks about health care, affordable housing, education, employment, skill training. All those things become part of it. We know that from our work with Children Risk with the education thing. You know, I always tell Bob, I say, Bob, when we do our rankings every year, I love the rankings. But, you know, the top ten schools are the top ten schools. And most of the time, it ends up being many times the same top 10 schools. Let's give them kudos for their achievement, for the parents who work, worked hard, who raised extra money. But it's not about the top 10 schools. It's about the bottom 10 schools, who end up also being the same bottom 10 schools. What are we doing for those? What are we really doing for those? We just, just highlighting that they are the bottom 10, eh, so what? And so I think it just begs a different kind of honest dialogue and discussion about these issues. Again, it's not pointing fingers, it's not pointing blame, it's not about who's right or wrong, it's not any of that. It's about moving from tolerance to an understanding of the middle passage of respect, of respect that allows us to get to acceptance. Because until we get to acceptance, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get anywhere. Acceptance of the other human being, just because they're a human being, no other titles, no other labels, what do we need for the full fulfillment of that human being to the fullest of their potential? That seems to me should be the goal of every nonprofit, every organization in this city. And I think that we can get there, but I think we have to have a lens. And the lens for me is this wonderful opportunity that has been given to us for this 19, 20 year lens from now unto the glorious 200th anniversary of the city of Houston, roughly around August 23rd, 2036. Mayor Sylvester Turner is the 62nd mayor of the city of Houston, given the way terms and term limits work, probably the 64th or 65th mayor on August 23rd, standing in, in Discovery Green, having a great bicentennial celebration. Uh, the Hispanic mayor or the, uh, the African-American woman mayor or the Hispanic woman mayor, whatever, something like that probably will happen. What do we want to be like, feel like, act like? What do we want to be known as the city on the hill, the shining city, that made all of this thing about diversity and pluralism real, that moved from diversity about counting how many this, how many that, that moved to pluralism in a pluralistic society that says, in a pluralistic society, the only thing that matters is that all human beings count. In diversity, we still count how many of what kind. Hmm. That is an international metropolitan city, a pluralistic cosmopolitan city that looks after all of its citizens equally. That's where we have to go. That's where we have to get. I think we can get there, but it's gonna take a lot of changing in the way we operate. It has always been about our lens and our filters. It is always about how we think, feel, and act around issues. It affects our personal, professional, and public lives. I think we can get there, but I think it's gonna take a lot of hard work. Well, that is fantastic. Thank you I'm so much for I'm excited about your the future. Thoughts. So, so are we. So am I. I mean, this has been a fantastic conversation. 
I think we ended on a great note, and thank you so much it's always for your fun. time. And thank you for being with you, Shay, and thank to you, the class, and thanks to Dr. Bob. All right, thanks, class. Thank you.